Hello and welcome to this summary of everything you need to know about the poem Captain Cook to My Brother by Letitia Elizabeth Landon. Before we go into the details and analysis of this poem, the most important thing you need to bear in mind and to understand and which will frame your understanding of this poem is contextual factors related both to the poet herself, Letitia Elizabeth Landon, but equally who Captain Cook was, okay? So this is really, really important because context really, really heavily influences this poem, okay? So as you can see behind me, I have highlighted and created a mind map of all the main contextual factors that you should be aware of when you are learning about this poem, which appears within Edexcel's Belonging Anthology. And after we go over context, we'll then look at the poem in detail, we'll read through it and then analyze it and talk about literary and structural techniques, okay? So now, the first thing to bear in mind, contextually relating to Letitia Elizabeth Landon, is she is a Victorian writer and of course a Victorian poet. She was born in Chelsea, of course, this is a, still a very fancy part of London, so she comes from a very bourgeois, upper middle class family, okay, and she was born in Chelsea in 1802, and she was homeschooled, okay, so she never went to formal school, but she was homeschooled by her parents, okay? So, one thing to bear in mind is that she never, even if she never um, achieved formal education in school, she still was highly educated. The second most important thing to bear in mind, and of course this influences the parenthesis within the title of the poem, okay, parenthesis is just a fancy way for brackets, so when she's talking about to my brother, she wrote this poem in the 1800s as a dedication to her younger brother, okay, so she was very close to him. And her young brother was called Whittington Henry, who, because they were really close, so he was only about two years younger than him, or rather younger than her, and uh, they used to play together as siblings when they were small, and then later on when he grew older, she ended up paying for his education. Remember, of course, Victorian society uh, was quite sexist against women. In fact, Letitia, Elizabeth Letitia Landon actually herself never, when she wrote and published her writing, she never published it under her full name. She used the gender neutral uh, initials, L-E-L, -E okay? So this is the first initials of her name in order to cover her gender, because at the time during Victorian England, it was seen as improper for a woman to be writing, to be expressing herself very outwardly. Women were expected to be very passive, submissive, and so on, okay? So going back to this, of course, and also even the fact that she never went to a formal school, again, it wasn't really seen as a thing to educate uh, and to spend all of this money educating your daughters who were gonna get married off anyway, okay? However, her brother, he did attend school and she ended up paying for him, okay? And especially after their father's death, it was her writing that supported them financially, okay? So of course, this very close relationship influences what is within the brackets of the poem, okay? So on the one hand, we learned that contextually, she was very close to her brother. Also, when it comes to uh, Elizabeth Letitia Landon herself, in 1836, she ended up marrying a man called George McLean, who was governor of what we know today as modern day Ghana, okay? So she ended up marrying a man, and of course, she lived in what is today modern day Ghana. This was during the time when the British Empire had control over Ghana, okay? So she lived there for a while. However, she only died two years later, okay? And this is after taking prusic acid as a way to treat a syndrome that she had, which was called stroke. Adam okay so unfortunately she never really had a very long life and she used to take this medicine unbeknownst to her it was a uh, quite a poisonous concoction that of course probably contributed to her life being fairly brief okay now in terms of the other title of this poem Captain Cook it's really important to be aware of who he is okay so Captain Cook is a British or was a British explorer he was also a navigator cartographer cartographer people who you know go to places map out the places and draw maps up and he was also a captain in the British Royal Navy. Remember that the 17 and 1800s were a great time of British Imperial expansion so of course Captain Cook contributed to this British Royal expansion to other parts of the world. Indeed he achieved the first recorded European contact with the eastern part of Australia as well as Hawaii and he circumnavigated which means uh, basically uh, got onto a boat and then surrounded and went over and you know completed a complete cruise in New Zealand okay so he really made some achievements which uh, were seen as a huge historic achievement from the British perspective especially during a time 
when the British Empire was at its height. It was known as the empire where the sun never sets and it, the British Empire, of course, uh, at its height occupied one fifth of the world, okay? So this is really important to bear in mind and it's really important to know who Captain Cook was, okay? The other thing is in terms of the poem's message, this poem recalls Landon's childhood with both her brother and they learn, of course, and they end up idolizing Captain Cook and his achievements. So now that you have this contextual information relating to the poet herself, let's read and analyze this poem in depth. So let's read through this poem, Captain Cook to my brother. Do you recall the fancies of many years ago when the pulse danced those light measure that again it cannot know? Ah, we, both of us are altered and now we talk no more of all the old creations that haunted us of yore. Then, any favourite volume was a mine of long delight from whence we took our future. To fashion as we might, we lived again its pages. We were its chief and kings as actual, but more pleasant than what the day now brings. It was an August evening, with sunset in the trees when home you brought his voyages, who found the fair South Seas. We read it till the sunset amid the boughs grew dim. All other favourite heroes were nothing beside him. For weeks he was our idol. We sailed with him at sea, in the pond amid the willows the ocean seemed to be. The water lilies growing beneath the morning smile. We called the South Sea Islands, each flower a different isle. No golden lot that fortune could draw for human life to us seemed like a sailor's. Mid the storm and strife, our talk was of fair vessels that swept before the breeze and new discovered countries amid the southern seas. Within that lonely garden, what happy hours went by while we fancied that around us spread foreign sea and sky, ah, dreaming, and the distant, no longer haunt the mind, we leave in leaving childhood life's fairy land behind. There is not of that garden a single tree or flower. They have ploughed its long green grasses and cut down the lime tree bower. Where are the gilder roses? Whose silver used to bring with the gold of the laburnums, their tribute to the spring? They vanished with the childhood, that with their treasures played. The life that cometh after dwells in a darker shade, yet the name of that sea captain cannot but recall how much we loved his dangers and we mourned his fall. So, of course, this poem is interesting because it illustrates this reflection on childhood. So the speaker is speaking directly to the brother. They're saying, oh, can you remember this time during our childhood when we used to play around? But also it shows a key turning point where they discovered the adventures of Captain Cook through a book that the brother brought back and they really idolized him. So let's analyze the verses in detail of this poem. When it comes to the title of the poem itself, bear in mind that there's two elements to this title that you need to bear in mind. Firstly, there's a reference to Captain Cook, who's the famous British explorer. But within the parenthesis, which means brackets, to my brother, here we can see that the speaker is also showing the close relationship that they have with their sibling. And of course, contextually, as I've mentioned in my explanation of context, Letitia Elizabeth Landon used to be really close to her younger sibling, her brother. So let's look at the poem. Now, as I've mentioned, the reference to Captain Cook is the British explorer and captain who used to work in the British Royal Navy, who achieved the first recorded European contact with Australia, Hawaii, and New Zealand. So this poem is a celebration of his memory. In the first verse, the speaker talks directly to their brother and they state, do you recall the fancies of many years ago? Here, the second person pronoun you establishes this familiar tone, okay? So they're speaking directly to their brother. Then they mention this happened many years ago. So this is a nostalgic reference to their childhood game. We can sense that the speaker really misses being a child, really misses the games that she used to play with the brother and the closeness that they had as siblings. Furthermore, the reference to the pulse dance. So here, personification is used to show the excitement when they used to play together, okay? So the, the pulses, the hearts used to beat really rap rapidly. Moreover, the exclamatory sentence in this second line shows how she is really rueful when she's thinking about this memory. She can't believe that, you know, they're no longer kids, they're no longer having all this fun, and she just misses this. 
furthermore, in the third line of the first stanza, the speaker states that both of us are altered. Now here, the caesura after altered switches from the past, where they're talking about many years ago, now to the present, where the speaker is saying, now we're adults. In the following stanza, the speaker states, then any favorite volume of a mine was long delight. And again, here, this is an adverbial phrase of time. OK, so the speaker shifts now back to the past when she was a kid and she's staying that is saying that any favorite volume and volume here is books. OK, so books, uh, you know, a, a voluminous book is like any large book. And they're saying, you know, any kind of book that was put before them as a kid, they used to just really enjoy. It was long delight. And the speaker is stating that any favorite volume, so the book, uh, was a mine. Now here, the metaphor indicates that any books they read were like an adventure, okay? It was almost like they were going and digging this mine and finding all of these valuable treasures within a book. Moreover, the reference to our future and fashion in the second line of the second stanza, the use of alliteration here shows their excitement when they used to read adventures, okay? They used to like really dig into this. Also, the repetition of the plural pronoun we, so we lived again in this page as we were its chiefs. What this is showing is this really close bond that the speaker shared with her brother, okay? And here what this is illustrating is almost that they're mourning this loss of childhood and maybe because they've grown up, become adults and with, you know, the busyness of adulthood, they just don't have enough time to spend together anymore. Also, they used to imagine that there were chiefs and kings. And here, these two words belong to the semantic field of royalty. Again, here, what this is illustrating is a speaker just used to love how her and her brother used to sit around, imagine that there were royalty. And this is also showing this unbound uh, childlike imagination. So, so kids and childhood, it's always fun because you can literally be anything. And as you grow older, you start becoming more cynical and then you start putting limitations on yourself. So she really misses this bad time when there were kids and they used to just imagine there could be anything there could be royals it could be chiefs it could be kings also the reference to delight and pleasant in this stanza belongs to the semantic field of happiness which shows that the speaker is nostalgically reflecting on how she used to love playing with her younger brother then there's another adverbial phrase of time here okay so as opposed to the beginning of this stanza where they're speaking of then they now shift back to the present, now brings. Okay, so this adverbial sh phrase shifts to now the mundane present, the present tense where now they're adults, it's no longer fun, they, they're not having all of this imagination, maybe they're not even spending that much time together as siblings because they're just leading their own lives. In the third verse, the speaker states, it was an August evening. So now they go back to time. And again, there's a shift back to the past and it focuses on our attention on an anecdote. So we learn that something happened on this August evening and there was sunset, okay? So here, sunset is repeated twice and this use of pathetic fallacy sets a, sets a soft, somber atmosphere and also creates a nostalgic feeling. The speaker then reveals, okay, on this August evening, you brought his voyages who found the fair South Seas. So she's saying, oh, on this one particular evening, this is when the brother brought a book back, which is talking about Captain Cook's journeys. Okay, voyage is just the French word for journey. Now here, this is alluding to the main part of the title of the poem, which is Captain Cook and who he, you know, he discovered, according to them, the fair South Seas. And of course, this is the area where there's Australia, New Zealand and so on. Then once they found out about Captain Cook, all other favorite heroes were nothing beside him. So here, the hyperbole nothing shows how much admired Captain Cook and his adventures. So she states, once they learned about Captain Cook as kids, all the other heroes that they used to worship and admire, now all their adventures and anything they achieved paled in comparison to what Captain Cook achieved on his adventures. In the following verse, the speaker uses anaphora. He and him reveals their obsession. So now the kids have discovered who Captain Cook is. They're now obsessed. They read his stuff. They sail with him in their imaginations as they're reading through his books. And the reference to sail, sea, ocean, and South Sea, this is nautical language. Remember, nautical language is just language related to the ocean, the travel, travel on the ocean, on the Navy, and so on. Okay, so here, the speaker is referring to how they almost greedily read through everything about Captain Cook, all of his adventures and they imagined that they were there with him sailing with him and discovering all of these new places with him in the following verse the speaker states no golden lot that fortune could draw now here this is a metaphor which states that anyone who fate 
picked to be a sailor or a traveler was really lucky okay so there's no other lot that fortune or fate could pick for you that's luckier than a sailor's then the sibilance in seemed sailors storm and strife emphasizes how much all they have for sailors who seem really free to travel and see the world and don't forget that captain cook himself was a sailor he was a captain and he managed to see the world also, the simile like a sailors show that they have this amazing wonder and admiration at the job of Captain Cook. The reference to also to before the breeze. So alliteration here of B, which is a plosive sound, so before and breeze, echoes the movements of a ship on sea. So they're now imagining, oh my gosh, it would be amazing to be on this ship with Captain Cook and, uh, and discover all of these new places. Okay, so there's lots of wonder that's illustrated in this verse. Furthermore, there's this repeated reference to South Seas and Southern Seas, okay? So South Seas is repeated in stanzas three, four, and five, and this alludes to Cook's own contact. So this is Captain Cook with Australia, Hawaii, and New Zealand, which are all along the Southern Sea. In the next stanza, the speaker talks about that lonely garden, and this is a reference to their home's garden when they were kids, which was a place of discovery, almost like the Garden of Eden, okay? So this is kind of a very soft biblical reference, and remember that Garden of Eden was a place of exploration for Adam and Eve, but also a place where they ended up losing their innocence when they obviously ate from the apple and the tree of knowledge and life. However, the speaker states, what happy hours went by. Now, the alliteration of H and happy and hours shows the innocent joy that they had. Okay, so unlike Eve and Adam who ate from the tree of knowledge and, you know, this caused the unhappiness to set in. Actually, she just reflects on only just all the great things that they discovered in this garden. The speaker then states, well, we fancied around us spread foreign sea and sky. Now, here we can see the reference to foreign sea and sky their childhood imaginations are shown through this semantic field of nature. They're just imagining, oh my gosh, what would have Captain Cook seen when they when he was on sea, looking up at the sky, uh, you know, the endless possibilities of discovery that he embarked on. Furthermore, the minor sentence R shows that the speaker is just so happy as she remembers how she, they used to feel as kids. They were reading through this and just feeling all of this excitement. This is really aptly captured in this minor sentence. Also, the reference to dreaming and distance. So the alliteration of D here reflects how much the speaker misses their childhood and the childlike fascination that they had with adventure and exploration. Furthermore, they mention we leave in leaving childhood, life's fairy land. So here, this verse is ending with her talking about them becoming adult, adults and they're leaving life's fairy land behind. Now here, this is a metaphor for how blissful childhood was. It was like a fairy tale and a fairy land. And sadly, they have to leave and now go into the harsh, boring reality of being adults. In the following verse, the speaker talks about now as adults it's not of that of a garden a single tree or flower so now here semantic field of nature where they're talking about how as adults they don't have this garden where there's even a single tree or a flower tree and flower is used part of semantic field of nature to show that adulthood is really melancholic it's exciting they've now been kicked out of their own garden of eden okay so they had this garden of eden when they were kids they were having all of these explorations imagine captain cook and now as the adults they've been kicked out of this garden they have no access to it and now they're suffering just like adam and eve were kicked out of the garden of eden in the following line, they mention they have ploughed its long roots and grasses and cut down. Now, the verbs ploughed and cut down, which are a little bit violent, emphasise the pain of adulthood. Moreover, the reference to silver, gold, okay, so the semantic field of colours are used here to describe the different uh, bits of nature, okay, and mainly uh, plants and uh, flowers, so roses and laburnums. And this shows the beauty of nature, which they used to see as kids, it's now faded as adults. In the following stanza, the speaker talks about they have vanished, the childhood, that, their treasures. Now here, the alliteration of T emphasizes her mourning at the end of their childhood. So they've lost so much and the speaker is so sad when she thinks about how much fun she used to have with her brother as kids. Also, they talk about the life that cometh after. So this is an allusion to the afterlife, which usually means death, okay? So afterlife is death. However, in this case, afterlife, the life that has come after them being kids is you know, the life is adulthood, which lacks fun and adventure. 
Furthermore, this life, this adult life that's cometh after, it dwells in a darker shade. Now here, the alliteration of D shows, uh, creates a more ominous feeling, okay? It shows that adulthood is brought on darkness, sadness, as the imagination and even the freedom has become more restricted. However, they talk about the name of that sea captain. So again, this is another reference to Captain Cook, who symbolizes adventure, who symbolizes being unbound, being free. Then she states how much we loved his dangers and we mourned his fall. So the repetition of his hair, again, this is Anaphora, shows how much she really still admires him. Also, the Caesura hair after dangers shows that part of life being a sailor, of course, was quite dangerous. And of course, this also, you know, he also ended up dying, his fall. And hence, really, that's really it when it comes to understanding Captain Cook. So thank you so much for listening to this summary of this poem. I hope you found it useful and enlightening and thank you so much for listening.